Okay, good morning everybody. Al Ferry is having a wonderful day. So before we get back to where we were last day, I just want to make a remark for you that I'll be releasing assignment four later today. So this will be probably some time in the evening. So in this one, you'll be mostly playing around with graphs and graph algorithms. So it should be a graph all time. <laughs> okay, so that being said, I want to get back to where I was last day. I was talking about weighted graphs. So I was at the end of lecture, I was describing to you what a weighted graph is. And it, the idea is quite natural, is what we do is we assign typically numbers to the edges. There's also weighted graphs where you can assign it also to the nodes or vertices of the graph. But most certainly the most common one you're going to run into is where the edges have a weight or cost on them. So we usually call these weights or costs. It depends on usually the context of what the problem is. But usually it's just a weight. It's supposed to represent all sorts of different things. So just as an example here, here's a graph here. If I wanted to know the weight of the edge AD, all I do is I just look at the, the number on that edge. So for example here, it's three. If I look at BF, notice that the weight is nine. Can somebody tell me what's the weight of, of the edge with endpoints C and E? Yeah, exactly. See, see, like it's, it's really, it's just a generalization of what we were talking about with a graph already. Uh, can somebody tell me why? Why is this weighted graph concept? Why is this just a generalization? It means it's much broader. Why is this just simply a generalization of it, of, of our original definition of a graph? So think of, I want you to think about it this way. So suppose I gave you some graph and I really just notice that I did, I talked about DFS and BFS and all of these. And I just assumed that the, the graph didn't have any weights, right? Very often those algorithms don't really rely on that information. But you can almost view the, the original definition I gave you as if all of the weights on the edges were the exact same. So it could all just be that all the weights on the edges are just one, for example. And all the concepts that I described previously, they naturally will translate. So many algorithms like DFS and BFS, the weights themselves don't really matter. However, the way we interpret the weights can. That's why we're going to be talking about a couple of problems we call optimization problems on graphs. And I'll be trying to illustrate how we can use this extra information to encode different kinds of problems and how we can solve these problems. So for example, these weights, just exactly like was mentioned in the chat, is that you can look at these as distances between two points, for example. Just like in the example I gave when we first started talking about graphs, I talked about, oh, if, I, if I'm going from one location to another, I'm walking through the, my favorite park. It's just no, like I can encode that distance using the weights. Likewise, these could represent cost, for example, as in going to be relevant for our next problem we're going to be looking at. But like I said, these weights can represent all sorts of different things. But for us on our side, we just care that they're just some numbers. And I'm just going to assume that they're integers, typically, unless I tell you otherwise. So I want to come back to one small, actually first before anything, is everything clear about the weighted graphs? So just remember, I'm just going to assume that now there's this weight function, weight or cost function, that's going to assign to each edge a number, and that'll be what we call the weight or cost of the edge. Okay, give me a thumbs up if we're all good. I just want to make sure we're all clear on that before I proceed. Okay, great, great, wonderful. So I want to remind you of something I said the other day is the notion of a spanning tree. So if I give you some graph G, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, when I give you a graph G, a spanning tree, T, is a subgraph of G. It's going to consist of all of the vertices of G. So this is what we call a spanning subgraph, but it has a particular structure to it. It has to be that it's a tree. That's why we call it a spanning tree. So 
As I mentioned the other day, I told you that spanning trees can be computed using DFS or BFS. Can anybody tell me how I can get a spanning tree assuming that the graph G is connected? Can somebody tell me what would the spanning tree be for either case? You can tell me one or the other or both. Anybody have any ideas? Yeah, it does depend on the starting point, but that's exactly what I wanted to hear. It's, it involves the discovery edges, right? Remember, I told you about that those discovery edges form a tree, right? And in DFS, we called that the DFS tree. In BFS, we talked about the BFS tree. So if you wanted to get a spanning tree, all you have to do is just give me that tree. So just the one that's formed by those discovery edges. Exactly, perfect, wonderful. So this is sufficient if I just want any one old spanning tree. But here's the question I wanna have and this is the one we're gonna focus on in this lecture, is what if I wanted a spanning tree for some weighted graph like this one, where if I wanted to look at those edges and I wanna look at those weights over there, those lovely, lovely weights, and I wanted to account for those. So if I include an edge in my spanning tree, I wanna include the cost of including that edge, i.e. adding its weight, so that when I end up with the spanning tree, I sum up all of the costs along all of those edges, and we call that the total weight or total cost of the tree. Um, I would like to find a spanning tree that has this property. So just to give an idea of what I mean by this, so just to make sure I'm clear. So remember, I can just find any old spanning tree in this and it'll have some cost to it, right? For example, if I include, say, say this edge from B to C, then we go C to E, F, and then go to D, that would consist of all of the vertices. And in fact, it would be a tree as long as I make sure I include only these edges. But notice that the sum of these would be four plus seven, that's 11. And then we have the plus six, that's 17. And then I would mean that I have, I think it goes up to 25 at this point when I include the eight, and then I have 28. So the cost of this tree would be 28. However, I could potentially do better. Here's, a, here's another tr spanning tree. So for example, if I include the following edges, so suppose I give you a spanning tree that consists of these red edges. Can somebody tell me what the total weight or total cost of that tree is? So just remember, the way we're going to define total weight or total cost is just the sum of the numbers on the edges. So, so far we got a 21 in there. Let's just double check. I'm pretty sure you're right. Let's see, four, three, that's seven. And then we have another three, that's 10. Yep, yep, exactly right. Yeah, perfect. Oh, wonderful. It's a good thing I know how to do arithmetic today. <laughs> but no, I can rely on the chat to know all this stuff. They're the pros at this. I'm wonder That's wonderful. So we got 21 would be the total weight of this. And this is actually the best you can do. So this is one possible spanning tree and it has minimum total weight or total cost. So we're gonna be interested in computing these types of spanning trees. So does everybody understand the game plan? So I'm going to give you some graph, and I'm going to assume it's connected. And what I would like to do is I would like to compute one of these spanning trees that has the minimum cost or minimum weight, where I assume that the weight or cost of a tree is simply the sum of all of those edge weights for all of its edges. So are we okay with the game plan? Give me two thumbs up, we're all good to go because I want to kind of walk us through this more carefully now. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So let's head on over here. I'm gonna take us 
slow walk over this way. Gotta cartoonishly walk this direction. Okay, there we go. So let's, uh... As I slowly walk this way, by the way. <laughs> okay. So. I want to talk about how we're going to be approaching this and just why this would be relevant for us. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a, of a story about this as a cute puppy barks. <laughs> the, um, let's see here. Ah, uh, let's see here. So, like I said, this is our objective. This is the one I had mentioned. I will show you the puppy one day. If the puppy gets near me, I most certainly will. Her name's Lola. She's absolutely adorable. She sort of ran off that way. <laughs> um, so, you might ask, Dan, why would we be interested in these so-called minimum spanning trees? Uh, well, the natural way that usually people think about these spanning trees is naturally within the design of networks. So typically in uh, communication networks, so think of telecommunications or just generally transportation networks, for example, the delivery of electricity. So just as an example, what I mean by this, and this is actually one of the more natural motivations of why people studied this problem, is say, for example, you have a bunch of electrical lines or power lines, or say these are telecommunication lines, for example, for telephones. Uh, in about the in the 20th century, people are interested in trying to minimize the cost for building a telecommunication network. So you can think of it like I have a whole bunch of sites. So these you can think of as homes, and I want to be able to deliver, say, some communication, say for example, a telephone line, or this could even be something more broader like electricity to a house. So I have all my sites. And what I would like it to do is I would like to be able to ensure that every high house or site is in fact being delivered the service in question. So naturally it costs money to build these lines and install them. So if you think back to my picture I had over there, you can imagine all of those vertices like if they were houses and their potential ability to be connected among them, or if you think of these as telephone lines or power lines, that's an, another way of thinking about it, is I would like to be able to build the network so that I reduce and minimize the total cost of building the whole network, where the cost of building one line of this network is in fact one of those edges. So if I want to minimize the total cost of building the whole network, I want to minimize the total cost of all of the edges I include in the network. And in this case, the network is shaped like a tree. So typically this is the case when you run into like, I want to build like electrical network or I want to build any kind of these networks, typically the phenomenon that it forms a tree. Uh, so. So hopefully this gives you some idea of why this would be relevant. So in the 20th century, people are quite interested in optimizing with respect to this. And you can use and formulate that as this problem. So at least it's most classic counterpart. So this is a classic optimization problem. And up to this point, I have not talked at all about optimization problems really, right? So I want to give you just a flavor for what I mean when I talk about an optimization problem, because we're going to be talking about those plenty after this point, and that's going to be a big focus for the remainder of this course. So I want to give you just a general gist of how exactly our definition of a problem relates to an optimization problem, and I'll use the example of this problem to illustrate it. So remember my picture I showed you? This is like right near the beginning of the class, where I had I had some problem pi, right? And then I had all these instances. So these are all my problem instances, right? And I told you that we could say that the al like if I give you some algorithm and I would say, hey, look, I want to solve this problem pi, what it has to be is that for every instance or problem instance, each one of these dots, there could be infinitely many of them. I want to be able to give this to the algorithm and it has to produce me the solution. And if it does, then we say that that produces correct output indeed. And if I could say this for every one of the instances, then I can say I've solved pi. Does everybody remember that? That was something I said at the beginning of this class, right? 
So here's how I'm going to stack on top of this the notion of an optimization problem. So here's the idea. So each one of these instances, each one of these, will have some parts to it. And I'm just gonna draw you a fun picture just to illustrate this. So it's gonna ha it has what we call feasible solutions. So what a feasible solution is, is just simply a criteria for which the problem has to satisfy. So in our problem, a feasible solution is quite simple. It has to be that when I give you the answer, it has to look like a spanning tree. So a feasible solution here is a spanning tree. So there's going to be many, many, many feasible solutions. So remember, this is a set of possible solutions for that given instance. So each one of these, the answer will be some spanning tree. And when we want to optimize, we measure the quality of the answers based on something called an objective function. So we measure the quality of these. So we measure uh, quality using an objective function. So using some objective function. Now in our case, what the objective function is, it is just simply the sum of the weights in T, right? Let me just switch my marker here. So instead of just having it where we have just one solution, there's a whole set of these. Uh, so there's this whole bunch of possibilities. Like I said, BFS and DFS may give you potentially one of these feasible solutions, but it may not necessarily give you the best one. And how do we measure the best one? It's based on what we call an objective function. So for different optimization problems, you'll have different objective functions and they'll relate to the problem's formulation. So you might ask, okay, well, what, what is it for our problem? Well, we wanna always minimize, right? So in an optimization problem, you typically have what we call an objective. So this is to, to maximize or minimize. So in our case, we're gonna be minimizing because we wanna find a spanning tree that has minimum possible total weight, right? So I wanna get it so that when one of, I look at one of these solutions, what I would like it to be is that it has the smallest possible value for its objective function. So what does that mean? There's gotta be these certain ones in here. There's gonna be certain solutions in here that are going to satisfy this. And these are gonna be what we call our optimal solutions. So I'll often, when I talk about a solution, I'll just assume I'm talking about the optimal solution. I'll usually delineate or separate the concept of this. But if I wanna talk about any of these other dots, I'll just usually call them feasible solutions. Say in our case, for example, a spanning tree. However, these ones I've just circled here, these are examples of optimal solutions. So these are what we were going to refer to as a minimum spanning trees. So these are, so this would be a minimum spanning tree in our example. So this is just simply gonna be a spanning tree where the objective value is going to be as small as possible. In our case, that is de de uh, determined by the sum of the weights of the edges. So does everybody get, understand the general gist of this? So our goal is that we're gonna design an algorithm for each one of our problem instances here. And it's, the goal here is that we have to produce an answer that belongs to this smaller, smaller blob that I have here, not necessarily the ones I have outside here. So just to be clear, every feasible solution So every feasible solution uh, need not be optimum, but every, every, that says every, every optimal solution 
is feasible. So what I'm saying is an optimal solution has to follow the rules of the problem, the constraints of that problem. So for example, an optimal solution has to always be in our problem a spanning tree. It can't be something else. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. However, uh, you can say the other direction, of course, that if it's an optimal one, indeed it has to be a spanning tree, but you can't guarantee that any feasible solution is going to be the optimal one. That requires special structure we would have to prove. So does everybody see the general idea of this framework? So as we play around with more with optimization problems, you'll see how this is going to play out. You're going to see that I'm going to be rather specific when I talk about these all the time. So I just want to give you a flavor for what just the general idea is. So I have all my instances. Each one of these instances will have a set of possible feasible solutions. And there's some of these that are very special here. These we were calling the optimal solutions. We want to find these. So the problem here, of course, is that the number of possible solutions may be very large, exponential in fact. So this is why we require more delicate design of an algorithm as opposed to just simply saying, I'm just going to look at all of these, these potential solutions and just pick one. Um, we have to be much more careful than that typically because, like I said, this set may consist of many, many, many feasible solutions. So the problem we're looking at, our minimum spanning tree problem, this is going to be a, this is a classic in the area called combinatorial optimization. If you're curious about this and you want to ask me or discuss any of this with me after or some other time, this is an area I actually work in. Uh, so so when, it, when it comes to this, just keep in mind, we want to get the blob here. We want these blob, the, these dots in here. We want one of those. So it isn't just good enough to output any one answer, it has to be that it's optimal. That's what it means to solve an optimization problem. So is everybody clear about what I mean? Just to be clear to everybody. So when I design my algorithm that's going to solve this spanning tree problem that I have here, it always has to spit out for you a minimum spanning tree. It can't spit out just any old spanning tree. Is that clear, everybody? Okay, great, wonderful. So let's proceed, let's proceed. So let's head on this way. So let me just write out formally what the minimum spanning tree problem is, because it's a good idea. We have a clear formulation of the problem. That's the one thing that often does not get talked about enough in a lot of CS classes, that problem formulation is the key when, it, when you're trying to solve a problem. Sometimes the way you formulate the problem really helps you understand how you can potentially solve it. But it's also very important that you, everybody understands what exactly you're talking about when you talk about a problem. So that's why we're going with this. So just to be clear, I want to define a minimum spanning tree for you. Because I've given you all of these pieces to it. Let me just define what a minimum spanning tree is. So given a weighted, a weighted, I guess technically I would say connected weighted, but I'll say weighted connected, connected graph g is equal to ve. It is a spanning tree, a spanning tree T, whose total cost is just simply the sum over all of the edges in the tree, is smallest possible. So that's just me formalize what I said earlier. So naturally, I got to tell you what the, so I'm going to abbreviate this minimum spanning tree as MST. So the MST problem, or the minimum spanning tree problem, is the following. So given a connected, 
connected weighted graph, weighted graph G is equal to VE, compute a minimum spanning tree T of G. That's it. That's, that's our problem we're going to be looking at. So is the definition clear to everybody for what we're going to be looking at? So if we're good with this, let's proceed. Now, what I would like to do, and I want to really kind of touch upon something. Ah, what is WB? That's the weight of the edge. Remember we had this weight? So remember, those are our numbers on the edges for our weighted graph. So W of V, all I'm doing is I'm saying, what is the weight on that edge? So I'm just simply summing over all of these. Just like in our example we did just a moment ago. That's a great question, just to clarify these things. Okay. I wanna just briefly kind of walk back things just for one moment. I wanna talk a little bit about algorithm design itself. And you're gonna find that pretty much after this point, this is really where things are gonna start switching. Where at this point, we spent a lot of time talking about, we talked about algorithms, yes. We talked about data structures. We did a lot of discussion about data structures. You're gonna find that this part of the course is gonna really start edging more towards algorithm design. Where I'm gonna spend a lot more time trying to tell you things about the problems we're studying. And then we're gonna design an algorithm based on that. So. Probably you've seen some of these ideas previously, whether it be in something like CS210 or in this class up to this point. But I want to remind you that very often what we would like to have is some property that we could take advantage of when we're studying a problem. So for example, researchers such as myself or other algorithms researchers, what we'll do is we very often will study a problem, so just like this, and we try to identify a very special structure that problem has. And we usually sit down, bang our heads against the board. Don't, don't do it, by the way. Don't do that. that, that it kind of hurts. Uh, so the, um, what we do is we think about these problems very carefully, and we try to prove mathematically that dreaded M word. We try to prove some property that the problem has. And it usually relates to the structures that are used to describe them. So you're going to find very often when we study problems after this point, that I'm going to very often try to expose some property that the problem has and then design algorithms based on that property. So when people study these things even to this day, it's very common that's how it's done. Uh, why? Because remember, our goal is to solve the problem, right? It isn't just like, oh, well, kind of works. Like that's, that's not good enough for people like me. Uh, we want to know how to solve the problem, not kind of solve the problem. So. <laughs> So let's, so let me uh, talk a little bit about this. So I want to, uh, I want to show you an interesting property that minimum spanning trees have. So, so an important property of minimum spanning trees is as follows. So I'm going to give you a theorem. It's called the cut property. So this is a one that people typically will try to use to design algorithms or discover algorithms. Well, these are, these are quite old algorithms. Uh, there's some of the first of the bunch in this area. Uh, so, so I'm going to give you what is called the cut property. So this holds for the relation that we have involving these spanning trees. So I'm going to walk through this property very carefully and then I'm going to give you a sketch of the proof. I have the full proof in the notes. But it goes like this. This one's very wordy, so I will kind of break it down a little further. Consider any weighted weighted connected graph, consider any weighted connected graph, g is equal to ve,
where V1 and V2 are two non-empty. That means that they consist of at least one vertex. Two non-empty sets of the vertices of V with no common vertices, with no common, no common vertices. So for those that have taken say 310, you might naturally have a special name for this. It starts with a P. Um, think, think there's something about set theory. Uh, there's a special name for what I've just described here. If for anybody that has that background. Does anybody know what I'm referring to? It starts with a P. We have a special name for these two sets that they, what, what they exactly do to V. It's, it's what we call part, yeah, it's partition, exactly. It is partition. Yeah, so V is going to be partitioned by V1 and V2. So it means that all of the vertices, if you consider the entire graph, keep in mind, this property does not require this, uh, but if you consider the entire graph, you'll see that all the vertices are going to be split into two buckets, into V1 and V2. There's going to be two buckets. They're not going to have any overlapping vertices among the two. So if you consider the entire graph, that's what we call a partition uh, on the vertices. But I must stress that this doesn't necessarily require us to consider the entire graph, which is very interesting <laughs> uh, because that sounds, that sounds interesting. I know I'm, I'm buffing this up, so watch this. Watch this. Okay. So let E, so I'm gonna consider some edge in G with least weight where U is in V1 where U is in V1 and V is in V2 now now this is th this is the build up for this so i'm just going to consider some edge that goes from one vertex that's sitting in V1 to another vertex that is sitting in V2. Uh, that's the edge E. And this is gonna have the smallest, it's gonna have least weight. It's gonna have the smallest possible weight that I can have. I'll go into more detail of what I mean by this in a moment, but here's the idea. There is a minimum spanning tree. There is a minimum spanning tree that contains E. Boom. So, so if we can make sure that we pick this edge E, then most certainly I'll have, a, I'll have myself one step forward towards getting a minimum spanning tree, correct? So I want to talk about what this cut property exactly means, and I'm going to be giving us kind of a sketch of this. So let me proceed here. So, we're, so I'm going to be giving you an algorithm that's going to exploit this property. In fact, I'm going to mention briefly another algorithm as well. But uh, I have more details about that algorithm in the notes, if you're curious. But this is going to be the key ingredient for designing an algorithm that solves this problem. So, so let me give you the idea of this. So, so here's generally the idea when we try to prove this. So let T be a minimum spanning tree of G. So start off with this. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start using properties of trees. So remember I give you all those equivalent definitions of trees. This is where they're gonna become very useful. <laughs> so by one of the equivalent definitions, equivalent definitions of a tree.
if T does not, does not contain E, the E is the one I've stated here in the theorem. If it does not contain E, then it's addition, then, let me say then and then I'll say it's. Then it's addition. So I'm, I'm going to try to include E in. Then it's addition to T creates a cycle C. So I'm going to first set this up as follows. So I'm going to assume that T is a minimum spanning tree of G. And what I would like to do is I want to see if I can break, I can take advantage of the fact that it is a tree to see if I can weasel in this edge E so that, hey, look, it actually has to be a part of a minimum spanning tree. So I'm just going to say, okay, well, if T doesn't contain E, then that means E is just sitting out there on its own, not a part of this tree. But if I include E in, which I can, because it is a spanning tree, correct? That means that there has to be, its endpoints have to both be consisting in the graph itself. So when I put this in, it better, it actually has to create a cycle in the graph. So, now, let T prime be T plus edge E. So T prime is just going to be what I just described to you. I'm just going to throw E into the original tree T. Now I'm going to call that T prime. So I'm going to have T prime and T. So T is the minimum spanning tree I had before. T prime is in fact going to be this, this T, but I added in E. So T was a spanning tree. T was a spanning tree. So in T prime, there is some edge. This is some. Uh, some edge F is going to be equal to, its endpoints are going to be U prime and V prime. This is U prime and V prime along cycle C. Why does this exist? Remember, it was a spanning tree before. So when I include in edge E, this means that there is a cycle. So there's going to have to be some edge along that cycle so that it will be one of interest for me. So I'm gonna show you how I'm going to use this edge F to get something interesting. So here's the additional criteria. I'm gonna make this into a comma now. Here's the additional criteria for F. where it also has one endpoint, endpoint in V1, and the other is in V2. So, if I have that, I want you to, I'm going to draw you a picture to help really see what I'm up to here. So, so I'm going to have my two sets of vertices. I'm going to have V1 and I'm going to have V2. There's a whole bunch of stuff that could be happening on in here. I don't really care too much about that. Likewise, there could be a whole bunch of stuff going on in here. I don't know what's going on in there. Maybe they're having some racetrack or something. I don't know. The point here is that there's going to be that edge E that I've identified. And then there's going to be edges that cross over from V1 to V2. These are going to be edges. So these are going to be edges in the minimum spanning tree T. So 
you got to want to look at these edges here. So, so I have these edges here. And that's a part of the minimum spanning tree T. So if you're wondering, F is going to be one of these edges that I've just labeled over here. E is one I'm introducing for the cycle. Excellent, thank you. So let's, uh, let's see here. So what I would like to do is I would like to look at one of these, which is one of those is F. That's what's in this picture here. And I have E here. And I'm going to tell you that E has least weight. And I mean least weight among these edges. If you're curious about the name of the cut property, the edges here form what we call a cut. It's a graph theoretic term, where what happens is all these vertices sit on one side of the cut, and all of these vertices sit on the other side of the cut. So what I would like to do is look at the edges that cross the cut. So I'm telling you that E has least weight among all of these edges. So keep in mind, it could be the case that they're equal. It may be the case that one of these edges equals the weight of E. That may be the case. But I'm going to show you how you can include edge E so that it stays a minimum spanning tree. So here we go. Since E has least weight, since E has least weight, what does that mean? And remember, all of these edges I have over here, they are not E. And F is not equal to E. Then we know that the weight of E has to be it's definitely going to be bounded or relates to the weight of F. So we know this relationship is going to hold among F and E. It may be the case that they're equal. That's not going to matter too much for us. So all you have to do now is just remove, remove F from T prime. Then T prime is a what? what? What is T prime if I remove F? What is it? If I remove F, is it a spanning tree? Give me a thumbs up if you think now if I remove F from this, it's going to be a spanning tree. So the way you like to look at it is think of it like I'm switching out E with F. Well, it's going to be the case that it is actually a spanning tree, which is quite nice. Then T prime is a spanning tree. Is a spanning tree. And its weight is no more than T's. So what does that mean then? If, if it, it must be the case that the, the total weight or the weight of that tree is no more than the original one I started off with, T up here. What does that imply? That implies what is, what is T prime after I remove F? If T was a minimum spanning tree, then T prime is what? Somebody, somebody tell me, somebody tell me. Then what is T prime? What is it? It has to be that T prime is a minimum spanning tree too, right? Why? Because I swapped out F and E, and E has the least weight across all of those edges on the cut. So just to wrap this up, let me move on over here.
So after I finish this off here, I'm going to give you a summary of two algorithms that solve this problem, and then we'll talk about one of them in more detail next day. So, so let's finish this off. T was a minimum spanning tree. Therefore, the resulting, the resulting tree T prime must also be a minimum spanning tree. And we're done. If you're curious about this, and actually this is how the proof of correctness for one of the algorithms I'm going to show you actually works, is you use this cut property to derive a contradiction so that if you were to suppose that I gave you a better tree that the algorithm doesn't actually gonna produce for you, then what you could do is you can employ this cut property to yield the contradiction so that you can always show you how you can always improve the minimum spanning tree. In this case, all this is going to do for us is say, hey, look, if I, I can give you a, an equivalent minimum spanning tree where its total weight is, it's not gonna be worse. But hopefully everybody sees the interesting fact of this cut property here. So what does this imply? So what does it imply? So let me look back at my picture over here. Let me just scoot on back over here. So I want you to keep in mind this picture I drew over here. So when I talked about the cut property, I had these edges that go from V1 to V2. So I had these, and these are edges that go across this cut. So, so these are the edges I'm curious about. So these, they go across the cut. So what I would like my algorithm to do is always pick the least weight edge that crosses this cut. So different algorithms will employ this cut property depending on what V1 and V2 are. So the one that we're gonna focus on next day, we're going to assume that one of these sides just doesn't have anything in it at the beginning, but we're going to introduce vertices into one of these two sides. And the way we're going to do that is always by selecting the least weight edge across this cut. So we'll be building it up in that fashion. So let me just give you a brief summary of this and we'll wrap things up here. So, so there are two, and these are not the only two, but these are two well-known algorithms. that exploit, that exploit the cut property. So I'm gonna give you two algorithms. I'm just gonna briefly describe one of them. The other one I'm going to talk more about in detail. One of them is called Kruskal's algorithm. If you're curious about Kruskal's algorithm, I have, I'm gonna have an example in the notes and I'll just I have a brief description of why Kruskal's algorithm works in the notes as well. So if you're interested in Kruskal's algorithm, uh, here's essentially the idea. You grow a forest of minimum spanning trees from seeds. So what I mean by seeds, um, I'm talking about vertices. And this is actually quite natural to think about when you think about minimum spanning trees, because one other application that I didn't talk to you about is that minimum spanning trees also can be used for clustering. So when you think about these seeds, you can think of these as clusters. And the idea works like this for Kruskal's algorithm. You start off where you have clusters, where each cluster is gonna consist of one vertex in your graph. And what you're going to do is you use the cut property to join two clusters by finding the least weight edge that connects those two clusters. And the way Kruskal's algorithm does this is it sorts the edges, so you have your edges in the graph, you sort them from the smallest to the largest, and you take off each smallest edge, 
And whenever you, this edge allows you to join two of these clusters, then you include it in, into your minimum span tree, growing from one, sorry, two different clusters, one larger cluster, growing a one minimum spanning tree. And if you do this, say for example, n minus one times, you end up with actually growing from a whole bunch of smaller minimum spanning trees that you're growing up, like a forest, you end up with one big minimum spanning tree at the end of this process. So you start off with a minimum spanning tree forest or minimum spanning forest. Uh, then you end up with a minimum spanning tree at the end. Uh, the other one that I want to talk about, this is the one I'm going to focus on, is called Prim's algorithm. So Prim's algorithm works as follows. So let me just give you just a basic gist of the idea, because we'll go into a lot more detail about it in a moment. You grow a minimum spanning tree from a seed. So you can think of it like I'm just growing a whole forest, uh, but I only just need one starting vertex. So I start off with one vertex, and then you go back to my cut property picture I have over there, and you start off with one side of my cut having just this one vertex, then the other side of the cut has all my other vertices. So what I'm going to do is always pick least weight edges so that I don't create a cycle. And this is guaranteed by picking one across that cut. So. That's going to be how Prim's algorithm is going to play out. And so when we get back next time, we're going to go into more detail about Prim's algorithm. But if you find yourself curious about Kruskal's, I have a brief description and why Kruskal's algorithm works in the notes. So I want to say thank you very much and have yourself a beautiful day. I'll see you later.